Peter Falding, forensic search and rescue expert, professional diver, pilot, and a former paratrooper. He is the founder of the world-renowned Specialist Group International. Like a modern day version of the Thunderbirds, they search and rescue and sadly recover bodies 365 days a year. With such a tough, gruelling and sad day job, I set out on a mission to find out who is the real Peter Falding, the man away from the protesters, the rivers and the murder scenes. A very down to earth and humble family man and an incredible lover of animals. What does Peter do to escape from such a demanding line of work? Join me as I spend the day with Peter Falding. Hello! Peter! Peter! Now, I don't know if I'm at the right place. I've been outside now for about five minutes. Now, I am an hour and a half early. Rang him, can't get an answer. Oh, we've got a postcode. Just don't, should I start the search? No, I don't think that's a good idea. Falding! I don't think we're at the right place because there's a farmer here, but I'm going to see if he knows where Peter lives. Hello? Yep, yeah, I think we might have the wrong address, but we're in the right, we're in the right area. We're in the right ballpark. So let's see what this guy knows. Hello? Excuse me, mate. I'm looking for Peter Falding. Do you know? Is that Peter? Yes. Yeah. It's Luke. You're an hour and a half early. I am very early. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, yeah good. Nice uh, I've, I've, been, I've been trying to give you a ring, but I'm guessing that I'm on the track, so because, of, grass the, the because of the yeah, engine yeah, and no, the noise there. Yeah, so uh, well, a little bit early, but... Come on in. Did he just click his fingers? No way. Click of the finger, we're in. Just like that. Guys, come and join me. As I spend the day with Peter Falding, let's get to know the man behind the diving suit, the man at home, and the real Peter Falding. So the alpacas come over to have the breakfast every morning. We've got all this land, this beautiful land to roam on, but every morning they know their uh, they know their breakfast is is available up here. They have some nice treats. It's like a little snack, isn't it, Peter? Yeah, they don't need it. It's just a snack. They've got grass. Like they're grazers. This is Louis. Louis. So is it breakfast time, Peter? Yeah. <laughs> this is Peter feeding one of his best mates, Louis. <laughs> so what what is that then? What what's the what's the actual food? Oh, it's it's um it's pot belly pig food. Oh, oh he wants his food. He doesn't like that. He reminds me of my ex 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 girlfriend. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Wow. What's really wholesome to see is that after being here for only a few hours, noticing how all these animals are just roaming free right outside Peter's front door, literally as free as a bird. Fancy a drive in the army jeep, Peter says. Let's do this. You all know right back there? <laughs> we just give the videographer a pay rise. <laughs> Oh, are you getting paid? Watch out for the T-Rex chasing after you. Two islands over there. And what I'll do, I'll we'll walk over so I'll um, talk here. They come over. These, these are wild, some are wild geese. And the babies are born on the island. Uh, pretty amazing, really. So we'll walk around the lake and I'll follow them. Yeah. I'll call them and they'll come up for, for dinner. Oh, wicked. And they'll, they'll come right up and they'll eat out of your hand. I don't think many people know this about this side of you. No. You have all these animals. Well, I think right? I think it's, the it's trouble. Almost, it's almost there's there's petting zoos that have less animals than you do. I think I think the trouble is people see me in documentaries and things like that, 
and you you're always a grim reaper <laughs> you yeah. can't laugh yeah because you're doing them with the dark stuff you've got a very relaxed chilled out personality mm. but when you're talking about missing people and yeah. and uh, corpses and children that have been yep. murdered yep. You can't, you can't, that personality can't come out, can no, it, it, at it all? Come out, no. um, you have to, re like you said, you have to remain the Grim Reaper. Yeah. And then, obviously, when you then do any press, you're, you're, you're well, I, 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 I don't, I don't like doing press. I mean, on the recent case, and I'm not going to talk about it, but yeah. no one else was updating anybody. So I, everyone just swamped me. Yeah. I had no choice. And there was literally cameras being thrust in my face and nobody said, to me, Peter, can you stop talking to the media? Yeah, no it was one, like, it was no like you, you, were, you fronted the media. But no, I you, did, but, you, but it, I didn't want, I did not, I kept saying, I don't want to, do, I don't want to be doing this because the trouble is you're, you're led down a garden path and you don't want to be led down that garden path. And so if you look at every other case I've done, I don't talk to the media. No. We have, we have MOUs in place with various forces. You never see me in the media. The only thing we'll do is once we recover, then it'll get put out as a general statement to the media and we will just put that statement up on our and we'll promote the emergency services the response police fire yeah. ambulance and all the great work yeah. all the emergency services do i don't get paid for it people think you know that i earn loads of money out of the nicola bully case going on the media i didn't i that i got offered two by two one national newspaper for a story it's not a great deal of money yeah and another tv channel paid me and I said, I'm not taking the money. That money is going towards my life jacket fund, which, and it was clearly righted out to the, the fact we got paid in and it's on the statement. Yeah. It's in the life jacket fund for kids. So that, that bought a, quite a few life jackets for children. So I never got paid. I didn't enjoy it. I used to come home to my wife and I talked to her. I do not enjoy doing this. Yeah. And then you're getting others attacking you. They never saw my other work because I never go in the media. Yeah. And it's only when you read the book and then you go, wow, this guy's done a lot. Yeah. That you don't see the real me. And I did not enjoy it. And and obviously it backfired on me in ways. In in in, in ways it did, but like but, like a lot of a lot of the public know, like ninety nine point nine percent and and uh, most people that are what going to be watching this now, they they know what what kind of guy you are. Yeah. Uh, they know that you went there to go and help mm -hmm. uh, for free. Yeah, for free. Uh, yeah. To help out the family to try and bring back a missing loved one. Yeah. And, and that's what we always do. We get phone calls. I had a phone call from Scotland this week, and a, a, a boy was missing, but he uh, unfortunately served his aid search for six days. He couldn't have found, couldn't find him. Yeah. And then Ellis Downs, when Ellis was laying in the river for three days, and no one could get him and then we came in and found him brilliant so it's things like that but there was that was also free of charge april jones free of charge yeah my money my wages i'll stay on to finish these jobs when others will go well we're not paying you tomorrow so i don't care we'll stay and we just stay to get the job done yeah that's great that. so it's it's about very, compa bringing it's very compassionate. Yeah, it's bringing closure because I have to deal with these families mm. and I get to know them afterwards. Like, you know, Darren and Darren Downs when he lost his son, Ellis. And, it, you know, it's difficult. And we went to his funeral and it's just horrible. But every year he thanks me, you know, on his anniversary of his death, he sends me a really lovely yeah. message. They're a lovely, lovely family. Um, and, you know, it's well, they were let down badly, really badly. And um, anyway, it we we brought closure yeah and that's difficult sometimes so did you, you have know. did you have conversations with um april jones no parents? i didn't i didn't i again i i kept quiet i we done our job and went home again that was another job but no we didn't i i i wasn't near the family we were searching the river we were searching the the i had the helicopter up we we and and, and a massive job with the police the public <coughs> The mountain rescue, the cave rescue, the lowland rescue. They all, they all come out, don't they? Wonderful job. And the great British public all come together yeah, exactly. to help. And that's what I find. And, and again, with um, Lucas Dobson, the great British public came out. That's the great British public. You're Those who appreciate that you are there to do a job and the emergency services are there to do it. It's not just us. It's not about us. It's about, it's one big team. Exactly, it's, yeah. And it's especially when it, especially when it's children as well. Like if mm. you think back to like the Moors murders, Sarah Payne, Holly Wells, Jessica yeah. Chapman, April Jones, 
Um, yeah. James Bulger for the first couple of days until yeah. we obviously found out what had yeah. like, tragically yeah. happened. Everyone's yeah. out there walking. You see people walking, don't yeah. you? Like yeah. just like with a, a stick or a spade, or even just like looking on the floor. Yeah. Every bit, every blade of grass is checked, and it's yeah. everyone from all over the place. Well, we had a we we worked on the Nicola Payne, and we had the you know we had metal detector clubs want to help which was great i, oh, I didn't control because i had no control of who could come in and help but these guys find stuff you know they're great i i, I metal detect or take my daughter metal detect we use them at work but all these people who there's a program called the detectorist on tv yeah, I've really heard of it, cool yeah. Program. i like watching it but it's very true these people are all out these were are used to finding stuff hobby it's a bit like the cave divers who done the the um, Thai cave rescue. They weren't professional divers, yeah. but they're highly experienced. And I remember someone telling me that Rick Stan never had a diving qualification, but he's one of the world leading cave divers. Yeah. He hasn't got a qualification. He's just got tons of experience and a very brave man. Sometimes, and all them guys who went into the caves were extremely brave. Sometimes tons and tons of experience outdoes a qualification oh, anyway, in my well, eyes. I'm, I'm not a big believer in the zero to hero thing. Lots of people collect tickets. It's like people say yeah. to me, you got no qualifications on sonar. There is no qualification on the sonar to use a side scan. You don't go sonar. to sonar university, I, do you? No, <laughs> you know I'm a professional diver and everything else. But I, I think at the end of the day, it's like ground radar. There's not a qualification to you got a degree in ground radar. Yeah. There's forensic archaeologists who I work with all the time. They're forensic archaeologists. Yeah. But I'm good at search and I find things. But no one's given me a ticket. I had manufacturers training on the sonar but i developed that since 1999 and brought that to find anything in water wicked and ground radar as well and that's why i got used over the years and that's what people think my life in search goes back to 1999 lecturing at the national police search center and getting on for getting 20, 20 25 in. years now, yeah right? exactly yeah i see the old uh there you go look at you What's that? What's that? Uh, Floating duck food. Floating duck food it is. Hello guys. They're all so timid up there. Yeah, they're all like, they're uh, chilled, lovely. aren't they? Come on. Look, it's the runner. Coming in. We've got five furlongs. Come on, then. Come on. Happy ducks. They just wander, they live on the island, so they'll, they'll go back on the island. Peter is most known to the public for being a very prominent figure in the search for Nicola Bully. We all know that. We've all seen Peter stood outside the red trucks. We've all seen him stood outside the river. We're not making this film to talk about Nicola Bully, but this is obviously what Peter has become much widely more known for in recent times. But like I said, we're not here to talk about that and if you want to explain your reasons for that i'm sure the, the viewers would like to yeah. get into your head about why I, you know. I just want the family left alone now there's so much online i just went there to do my job and i assisted the family free of charge for yeah. that request i still talk to individuals you know up there so that's not an issue we never fell out or anything i haven't had it gagging order placed on me by what people were speculating. Some people have thought that. No, no, no. I'm, I'm my own person and I will speak out if I need to. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, and, and, but I'm not there to try and, um, I just, I want the family left alone and I, I just want, I, I'm, this was just one job that we volunteered for, free of charge, like I did April Jones, like I did Alice Downs, like have many other families, free of charge. We will be at a job where the, the police sort of have to get the stage where they have to scale down resources. Yeah. I've stayed on at my own cost. My own men get paid. We don't get paid, but we've then gone on to find people. And we, you know, I do- So that, that, that extra bit of time, yeah. extra commitment. It's just that is... this is another job. And, and, and because it's been so controversial for everybody, yeah. I don't want to make, create problems online. I don't want the family to suffer they've had their inquest whatever people want to think about that no i didn't go to the inquest i wasn't invited i wasn't asked for my opinion or my search search files which is sad but i'm not gonna i've already said i'm not gonna go and talk further about it because there is a college of policing review 
due out in November. So there's still a few things that are going on in the background. And, and it depends how that review goes yeah. to see what happens from there. What lies beneath? My life as a forensic search and rescue expert. Tell us about the book. Tell us what we get to learn about, about Peter Folding with this very book. Well, not many people realise, but I started my early age with my dad down the old disused mine workings in Merston in Surrey. So my dad went along, a, a gentleman called Dennis Musco rediscovered the old mine workings, he researched it, and he went down and dug a hole in the wood one day yeah. and broke into a section of mine. Dad got his old carbide lamp out and um, took it up there and he, he sort of looked at it and it was all polished brass, you know. Yeah. And his dad started going down, he said, can I give you a hand? There was four of them. They started going down the mines and then four, a few weeks later, dad said, do you bring, me, bring my nipper along? And he said, how old is he? And he said, he's five years old. And Dennis sort of frowned and said, he'd be good. You know, he, he's not scared of the dark. And I, anyway, he, they got me a helmet and there's pictures in the book of me at five years old and going down this mine. And what we used to do is used to come up with what they call boulder chokes where the, the old mine had collapsed in place. It's old yeah. firestone. I spent my life underground digging and tunneling as the mines got bigger and bigger and bigger they opened the new sections up as it got bigger and bigger it ended up being 18 miles of survey passages so wow. i knew it like the back of my hand and one day we were up there and we met the fire service who came up i started taking them down and as a guide and then within a few weeks they said well this guy's useful and they can we give you could we use you in case we get any call outs to Kids lost, and then one night a uh, call came in. There was these scouts lost, and I got called out. And there's fire engines everywhere. They needed me as a scout, scout along with Dad because we knew the mines like the back of our hands. Yeah, we didn't need pegs. If someone said there's there's kids in that section and they're missing, and, and one scout group was missing for about 13 hours down there. Wow! And they were just sitting in total darkness when I found them with the firefighters, and the scout leader was just crying his eyes out. They had no light and down there black is black without my dad taking me down the mines i would never ever have been doing what i do today how long did it take you to write the book you got it finished by june 2022 so it's about eight months have you got any more any more books or any more yeah. um, memoirs or anything coming out i have i'm else? actually working on a second book oh moment. really um, oh really cool and that'll be ready next year so I'm, I'm, I'm quite a long way through it now is it available um, it's available in the bookshop Waterstones, any good bookshop some 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 bookshop you just have to order is it, it just UK or can you get it abroad no, it's, it goes on sale um, in America which is the, really looking forward to it that'll be big October this year 2023 it's going in America we stopped all the advertising because I was due to do morning TV I was doing radio shows at the same time as the Nicola Bully case yeah, yeah. and we just cancelled everything yeah, yeah, and we stopped all advertising. So we're we're now starting to pick it up. I've got some book festivals. I've got the Isle of Wight Book Festival to do in I think it's October. I've got the couple in Oxfordshire. I think the Wantage Book Festival. Another. I've just done the one in Scotland. About the book as well about like through the Nicola Bully case. Yeah. I just want to say that through the, there's a few people that were saying trying to promote the book, trying to promote the book. I didn't even know you had a book until a couple of it, months ago. Well, exactly. It was never mentioned. It was never mentioned. And, you, you, and I'm not that sort of person. I, you know, I had the right to write my book. And the bike, book was written in 2022. Well, no one could... This predates Nicola. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I had every right to promote the book, but I did stop just through my integrity to go, right, I'm not going to promote this book. It's the wrong time. And I yeah, absolutely. And the publishers, we got emails to back it up. I pulled all advertising. And we yeah. stopped then about... Six weeks after the event, you know, no mentions of me on this case. You saw me, and I, I did not want to go on the news. I wasn't interested. No. It was just that no other people were. No one else was on there doing it. Doing it. it. So that was it. What I've done with the book, I've not spoken about any of the confidential work we do. No. I don't discuss confidential work. We've got the same guy who's been trying to discredit me since pre my book coming out. Now, my book came out on the second of February. And he, he let me pull book reviews, and we and and it's the same words all the time. I've noticed, and I've got no problem with pointing this out now on on film, that on the videos relate related to you, which have been yep. a, a quite recent. There's been about three or four yep. uh, different usernames. What I've noticed is that there's the same same kind of language and grammar, and the same. Um, 
same wording yep. is being put across that the same different the same accounts. Mm. So I've had somebody say, ask Peter Falden to show his show his radar, show his uh, certificate, show his qualifications. Yeah. Capital letters. I bet you he says not. This particular who I believe is one person mm. is trying to for whatever reason yeah. dis discredit you. you know who it is um, the same individual we know it is has written to my clients, tried to discredit us. I've had a guy who's an ex-police forensic um, IT specialist yeah. tracking this guy for the last six Golf. months. Golf. And I, all I can say is I hope he's got deep pockets because he's <laughs> going to need it soon. Don't discredit a man who is highly regarded in the field. You don't write a book and get it published by Pam McMillan. Yeah. And I've got the press cuttings. I've got all my training certificates. You know, I fly an aeroplane, I'm a helicopter pilot, I'm a commercial diver. All the public who've supported me, I Absolutely. get messages all the time. And I will say, I, I spoke at CrimeCon recently and two senior, very senior Metropolitan Police detectives come up to me and said, Peter, I wanted to meet you today. I've come over, I'll shake your hand, I've got your book. And I have worked with people, work, you have worked with it within the Metropolitan Police on the Chohan inquiry, you know, and the. The, the Malone case, Sharon Malone case, and various other, so many, too many to mention, that they've worked with me over the years. I'm not some person who fights their way into a crime scene. Yeah. I get invited, I, as a, I was a registered expert nationally, getting called in by national search advisors and crime teams to solve, locate evidence that has gone undetected for years. And that goes down like the land Harrod mine shaft in Wales found a shotgun 750 foot down a flooded mine shaft. Oh, wow. That's, nobody else could do that. We had the kit with the expertise to do it. Damien Tudge missing in the river 18 months. No one could find him. The river had been searched 12 times. They couldn't find him. I found him in his car. So without our side scan sonar, without our expertise, a lot of these people would be left in the river. A few weeks later, or a few days later, they would blow and they would float to the surface and be found by members of the public. Yeah. As more recently, a little lad was found in Scotland. He floated up, and they've been looking for him for days. So we have the technology, and the police forces across the UK do not have the technology that we have. Not as advanced kit, and they don't. They haven't got the expertise with it because they're doing a don't. And I'm not mocking the police. What they're doing, they're doing a normal job. And then they're brought into. You might use a sonar, but you, it, it's such a specialist piece of kit to use yeah. to get results. And I, I know I lead the field in that. And yeah. in the UK, I lead the field without a doubt. Yeah. My divers are ex-military and police divers. They're ex-police divers for so Sussex Police, yeah. Met Police. We employ them. You know, they're there, and they are the divers. So people say, "Oh, they're not quite." We are. We I can assure you, we're highly experienced in what we do with professional yeah. divers. Yeah, I've seen. I've seen that. And we've got the equipment. So there's a lot, there's a few people, very few in the professional world who have tried to knock me recently because they don't like what we stand for because they're trying to get us out of this. And there was one me recently, a, a particular ex-police diver who has been trying to rattle cages nationally to try and discredit me. And I say letters have been sent around to try and discredit us, but it doesn't stack up because when, this is why we win contracts, because when people come to us, they realise that I'm honest mm -hmm. and the team are honest and we do a damn good job Absolutely. and we get the job done. And that's why I can hold my head high. I'm proud of what we've done. And I would challenge anyone, anyone in the court of law to challenge my experience happily any time of the day on national TV. And if any anyone out there thinks they can knock me, bring it on. Let's take an exclusive trip to the world-renowned Specialist Group International. So this is the HQ then? This is where all the hard work is. Yep. So a lot of people will recognise some of these vans from the Nicola Bully case itself. Yeah. Was it four of these vans you took down? We took down three, three or four vehicles. Three or four, free of charge, doing a, doing a good deed. This is the first bit of filming that's actually took place at Specialist Group International. So quite a privilege really. Let's find out what goes on behind the scenes at SGI. Hi Lee, how you doing? You too. Stu's not here. And Ollie. 
No, it's doing it, yeah. And did it do some, uh, some drill? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. um, this is some of the teams, we've got obviously teams working elsewhere. Yeah. Um, quite a lot of over 50 of us, 50 units in the company. We train for any scenario, and that's why we get called in, because often the, the type of work that we get called to, other uh, people won't do. Yeah, yeah. Especially in the protest, there's like, you know, like trees in, in tunnels, and, and type of work like that. Nice slow descent, nice safe landing, and there we go, that is one person saved. You always need what's known as two points of contact. Okay. Um, so if one fails, you've always got to have a backup. Back in some of that situation there, they may have been on two, maybe sometimes up to four points of contact when that transition from one set of lines to the other set of lines is happening, just to be, again, just ultra safe. The minimum two points will be this device here, and this is, is this here. Yeah, so is that, this is that a carabiner? So this is a carabiner, yeah. this is called a Petzl ID. So this is a, a descender device. So yeah. it's a friction device which um, enables you to go down slowly. Yeah. Um, and this is a Petzl ATAP, which is a like our backup. So if this were to fail, this line, this, what this will do is runs on a, on a wheel there. And what this will do is if this line was to be completely cut and fail, that would kick in and lock off, and then we'd hang off this. Um, so almost, that's almost like a seatbelt job. Yes, and it's exactly just stop the friction. Yeah. And if there's any shock, extra shock load on the system, this will pay out. It's like a shock absorber. Brilliant. So it will just it's stitched, and it will just unstitch and act as a shock absorber, so we don't damage the line. And that's now locked. So um, if that was to fail, we'd just be hanging off that one now. Like that. Brilliant, brilliant. So you always have two points of contact, you've always got a backup. We've been involved in quite a lot of cases where um, like pieces come, you know, we'll, you know we'll, we'll go and do that for free or we've been on a piece job where they've allocated maybe a number of days. Yeah. And then we haven't got the result in the day and the piece called, you know, I'll get the guys, we'll stay on at my expense for another two days, three days, whatever, to try and get a result out of it, you know. You're, you're, you're getting paid. We're all getting paid, yeah. yeah. But it's coming out of my pocket. We need some proper resources. So there are very few underwater service units yep. in the UK now. So you could be left laying in a river, at least for search, as in on the bank. Yeah. But the person's actually under the water. Right. They're not going to be found. Yeah. They're not going to be found. They'll be just they're, they're, they're they're eventually there, they'll just float up. It's a month, unfortunately, a member of the public will find there are so many counties who don't have a dive capability right. in the UK. Yeah. And that's what's not public. And it needs to be public. It needs to be known that if someone's loved one goes in the river, you know, we're searching, but actually it's volunteers searching. Right, yeah. It's the Lowland Rescue, a fantastic job, Mountain Rescue, Cavers, they do a fantastic job. The police are more on the banks, unless they have an underwater search unit, they yeah. have, don't have the resources. Yeah. So that's where we come in with all our specialist kit. So it might take, they could be searching for a week and not find it. We come in on day one. We know that the bodies in that stretch of river I tend to find a lot of suicides to, to go into the water. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we do a fair, deal with a fair few suicides. Wow. And um, this year it's been pretty quiet on suicides, to be honest. But our car, there's obviously lots going on around, around the country. Yeah. And in this particular area, it's been, you know, it's been a, a, good, a good thing, really, isn't it? That it is a good thing. No, yeah. we, we, don't, we would rather be trained, we don't want to be recovering people. No, 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 A few weeks ago, we had the unfortunate task of uh, recovering a lady patient who got bitten by the dog, you know, fatally bitten, and uh, we had to recover her body because it was handed to us from fire rescue. Yeah. Because the bank was too steep. <laughs> so here we go for my first time ever in a helicopter. This is the very helicopter that Peter uses to fly in to very important, high profile, missing person cases. This is the same helicopter that swoops into schools all over the country to teach very important water safety lessons to children. Not only is Peter a forensic search and rescue expert, professional diver, but also a fixed wing pilot, and of course, a helicopter pilot. I actually streamed this helicopter ride live on YouTube at the time. So if you do wanna check it out, go to my channel, it's on the live videos. There I am pointing the camera at Peter. As well as filming this live, I did get chance to have a good scan around 
and see some beautiful Sussex scenery. And also, a very famous filming location. What you can see there is actually where Top Gear is filmed. I thought now's the opportunity to ask Peter a few questions about how you land the helicopter, how you fly it, all that kind of stuff. I was feeling rather safe until he handed me this manual and asked me to go to the how to land a helicopter section. You'll find out later in the documentary that Peter donates life jackets. Now at this point I'm thinking, does he donate parachutes as well? I asked him, have you ever crashed this helicopter before? He said, yeah, only twice. There and over there. Luckily for Peter, after a quick Google search, I managed to work out how to land the helicopter with only seconds to spare. Now it's time to go and visit Peter's mum, who lives on the same grounds. <laughs> Peter told me to prepare for a long walk and after about 50 yards, here already. Yeah, we're here the front. This is Nora. Hi, Nora. Hello. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Would you like to come in? Yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, of course it like is. Like a bit of a through the keyhole kind of, <laughs> kind of vibe. I didn't know this until I actually arrived onto, onto the grounds, is that Peter Falding looks after his mum. She's got her own little, what do you call it, a little cottage? A little mm -hmm. cottage out here. So at, at any any point you can just wander over to Peter's. Oh, go, I always then go over to Peter's, yeah. Go and see him. Yeah, have, he looks have, after me really well and he gives me dinner. You can get up in the morning and go for a, a, a just literally walk over 50 hours and go and see, make sure your mum's okay. Oh, yeah, and no, we see all the time anyway. So yeah, she, he comes over. She goes and washes the dishes yeah. up in the morning. And we go over the <laughs> Are you the are you the pot washer? Are you the pot washer over there? Takes Sparky for a walk. She washes yeah. the dishes. I knew, the, I, knew the, the, I knew the I knew there had to be a catch. But she, the reason why she's eighty seven, she doesn't take any medication, nothing. No, and I don't take any. She doesn't take any medication. She I need vitamins. The little glass of scotch at night. And she walks every day. What would you recommend is um, a good thing to kind of stay young and like stay active? Is it is it is it the walking? Is it is it's, it keeping your mind busy? What is it? Just walk in and have a scotch and water every night. Have a scotch every night, that is very important, <laughs> of course. And you still drive? I do. You still drive, don't yeah, you? I still drive, yeah, my little uh, is it your, is Fiat. It your, your little Fiat. Peter bought me. Keep active, keep walking, water, and most importantly, a nice little scotch. Now to look at some equipment used in some real life murder cases. People mainly know Peter for diving, underwater rescues and mainly kind of water work. Well that's not just your yeah. main field of expertise at all is it? There's, yeah. a, there's a lot more than just yeah. water searches. This was our first ground penetrating radar. We bought this back in I think, late 1997. You'll remember it, people will remember this from the Fred and Woe, the, Fred and Rose, the um, Fred and Rose West. That's well, I was involved. Wow. I was involved in that, but that's when they first used ground penetrating radar, and they got some archaeologists in to use it. So reading your book and reading about the Peter Tobin case, yes. was this involved in in the search of of his gardens? Yeah, this bit of equipment is the actual radar that I used to search Tobin's gardens, both in um, Scotland in Barclay and and down in um, South Sea as well. So um, not just this this style, this actual this actual machine. Wow! This actual machine was used in two thousand and seven to search Church's garden. Um, wonderful piece of equipment, reliable. But not only this bit of kit, this piece of equipment as well. This magnetometer here. So we got so much technical search equipment. Is this the magnetometer? Yeah, this is the magnetometer. It's a piece of kit that like that. That, that looks at the difference in the sort of magnetic force in the ground, if you want to call it that, it's, it's much more technical terms to it. Combined with the two, it gives me a great picture of rays. It's like there was a, there was a particular job in Boreham Wood where I found, found a Polish gentleman buried under the rear path. They couldn't find him. Wow. They had dogs there all week. Um, and I was working closely with a man, a good friend of mine, Mandy Chapman, who's the Met Police dog handler. Because okay. he was buried under, under a path so the dogs can't scent and they can't probe the ground. Yeah. So, and did you say this is this this will do about five meters? Yeah, we'll go about five meters. meters. That will go a lot deeper. Yeah. So that this these two bits of equipment straight away, I searched the path. I found the very dog, which I'll share the slides of. 
and then initially, then I found two hang, um, three handguns and 200 rounds of ammunition. He was an ex-soldier, so he just buried, nothing suspicious. And then, behind the greenhouse, I radar, and I was with Chris, and I said, I think we've got something. And then I run this over, and I got a huge target, of what they call a high purple yeah. underneath, which showed me something there. Then I got the magnetometer on it, and it showed that it was 0.9 of a metre deep. Lo and behold, oh, so it gives you a, like, good, a good reading. Oh, yeah. Exactly yeah. Where, it, where and then the Dr. target is. Dr. Carl Harrison, the forensic archaeologist, who's a great archaeologist, forensic archaeologist, he dug down. Yeah. And lo and behold, there was the body wrapped in sheets. So wow. it was absolutely fantastic. It was a really good find and um, it, it works really well. And again, on the Tobin case, this has found all sorts of things. It's not that it'll find weapons, it'll find drugs that were, we, we, we actually found drugs, or buried drugs to us. Sort of How does it detect drugs? Well, it'll, it'll find the disturbance in the ground, so we're looking for disturbance in the oh, ground. Right. It won't okay. stand and say, oh, there's some drugs, what it'll do, it'll show a disturbance. Yeah. And again, this kit, just like the sonar, is all about the operator. Yeah. You can buy this kit, and I can, I can, I teach students on my land, because I've got very old hackers, and I will say, when they meet their natural end, I don't kill them, I bury the alpacas on the land. It's quite light. Yeah. I'm just going to show the viewer. This is quite light. It's got six wheels, quite durable. So you've got a screen here. So do you want to talk me through how it works? Or I know you've got a newer model over there. That's right. Like, yeah, that that's, that's easy. That's one I tend to use. Let me just wheel them back yeah, over here. 26 years old, and how old yeah. is this? How old is this one? Oh, new. Three years old. This one. Oh, um, right, and and this one is one. ultra lightweight laptop. The software is different, yeah. and as you can see, it's a lot lighter. I actually pack this up and put it in the back of the helicopter, which makes it a lot, e lot easier. So, yeah, yeah, it's. I'd say it's about half the weight. It is half yeah. the weight, yeah. but it's, it's also a lot easier to strip down as well. So I can take this off and I can uh, pack it away, yeah, pack pack it away it. Uh, and, and fly it somewhere. So it's really good. The idea of this is we'll. We'll walk along that, we'll, we'll peg the area out. We're looking for a central grave site. Yeah. We'll walk along like this, and I'll be reading the screen, and it's saving all the data. But again, the important things about brave ground radar is you can't just go and pick it up and say, I'm going to find someone. You've yeah. got to have years of experience with it. So yeah. I've buried, you know, an alpacas, we, we, we've had buried foxes, and I'll go over it initially with one scan, and he won't see it. Okay, but then I'll enhance it, but then I'll use the magnetometer yes. and it will it will detect the disturbed ground. So in combination, they work really well. And again, metal detectors. We you know the Cape Crown murder, we found Cape Crown with a metal detector. Oh wow. ground radar had been used on the day, but it didn't find it. It wasn't used by me, it was used by others. They called me to re look to look at the search. Um, DCI Julia Morocco brought me in, and uh, this was the, the piece of equipment wasn't any good because of wet sand substance. Okay, so what we did in the end, I heard that she'd been very, very good. What just went over, and we put the pheasant pens back as they were. We went over, it's all in the book, and bingo, and there was a wrist with a watch on. So, I suppose when, you, when you're looking for certain targets, and when you when you get given information about they had a belt on or they had a watch and then a ring, yeah. that's like that's good a good use for you, isn't it? It, it, it is. Because you know that you've got something. If you knew if so if you knew of like say for example, you knew factually that like it was like a naked corpse, yeah. there'd be more of a struggle using obviously metal detectors. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You, that's why you have to have a range of toys and we've got things like pinpoint probes to go into tiny holes. We've got special cameras that can be fitted to go into rods to go up inside drains to look for body parts and things wow, like that. So it's, this is huge investment, you know, and, and again, it's having all the, to the tools in the toolbox. I'll just refer back to the uh, Peter Tobin case again. Yeah, yeah. That's largely, I've read in your book, that's largely spoken about in the book. It is, and it's fo the photographs are in there of me using that bit. Of yeah. you using this yeah, actual yeah, piece. Yeah. So again, what lies beneath available audio book available on Amazon. If you want to find out more about the cases, especially the Tobin case where this equipment was used, get yourself on that, get the book, um, even the audio book, you can listen to it a few hours at night, and you can learn about some of the cases which this actual very equipment was used on.
I'm off to search for some alpacas. So we're just driving around the 140 acres, it shows a small garden. But these are like your kind of escape, aren't they? Yeah, they are, yeah, yeah. Animals. See ya. Good morning. Keep you busy, don't they? They certainly do, yeah. Peppy nearly died, so we brought him in and nursed him in the winter. Right. Um, and, and let him out in the day, and he was shivering, he was cold because he was a very weak baby. And we kept him in the lodge. Yeah. by the fire oh really and we nursed him back and in the daytime we'd bring him out to mum because the winter was too cold not this year a couple of years ago and look at him now he's a beautiful animal they don't need food because they they graze they graze yeah. this is yeah. just a little tidbit for them so but they come over and they've got on. all they've got all this land to wander and to go wherever yeah, they want yeah, yeah. do, they, they, do they always travel in a herd yeah they do yeah, yeah they're pack animals yeah. yeah they do they live together so this must give you great comfort when you yeah. come back from the come yeah, back yeah. from the day job yeah it's brilliant and you've got these animals come on They've just been sheared. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to lead a trail on the floor for them, look. And they just have a little treat. It's just like a sweet to them. Look at your haircut. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say he's got the better haircut. I think they have. Now it's time to go inside the famous red vans. So we're going to have a look in our underwater search and recovery van now brilliant um, and this houses uh, quite a lot of our equipment but not all of our equipment that we would need for an underwater search uh, dive job basically um, so inside we got a call now we need to be out of the car park in three minutes flat we're just literally jumping the van and we know that this van is it ready to go kind of thing. ready to go yeah lots and loaded yeah so um so, so starting at the top then we've got obviously our recovery stretcher um don't need to explain what that's for really yeah. unfortunately if we, yeah. we, we find a person then but you don't really like to use this that much to be honest with we you don't. and it will be something that we put out last minute so even if we were looking for somebody we wouldn't get this off the van until we had confirmation that we found it they're secure we've got them ready to go because the last thing you want to do if families are there you haven't even got in the water yet and you start getting the stretches out and stuff like that because it just causes that anxiety yeah. that we don't want them to, to feel so yeah um and then these are our dive sets. So as a diver, to do any of the work that we do, we have to be commercially licensed. So okay. to drive a car, you have to have a license. To do the kind of diving that we do, you have to be on the HSE, so the Health and Safety Executive Register, um, as a licensed diver, which cool. I am, Peter is, Ollie, Stu, so a lot of the guys here today um, have all got their licenses, and you have to carry that with you. So if I was on a dive site, and the Health and Safety Executive turned up and said, where's your license, and I didn't have it on me, they could stop me from going in the water, so I have to produce that as a document. So that's a good thing, that. Yeah, it's a photo really ID, like a driving license. Professionalism. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So um, I think sometimes there's a perception that we're just like a, a keen scuba club or something like that. <laughs> Far from no, it. We are all licensed to do what we need to do. Um, so these are the two sets. You'd always have a diver one and a, what's known as a standby diver. So when there's a diver in the water, under the commercial licensing laws, you have to have someone on the riverbank, the lakeside, ready kitted up to jump in the water if diver one came across any problems like got snagged right. had an issue with their air supply um or just needed general assistance you'd always have a diver kitted up suit on air on so you're jump always, in. always kind of paired up then always paired sure. up. we've all got backgrounds where professionalism is key um and it's just the way you just have to operate things for safety absolutely um but also, not only will the diver have a standby diver with him, they'll always be attached to the surface. The diver will have a tender, both divers. You'll have tender one and tender two, like you have diver one and diver two. Yeah. And it's their job and their responsibility for the welfare of that diver, whether they be in the water or out of the water. When we're fully kitted up, when we've got all our kit and equipment on, we're about 60 kilos heavier. Right. So you imagine having a 60 kilo person on your body. Yeah. We're trying to walk around with all that weight because the diving that we do, we need to be on the on the bottom, like literally sunk to the bottom. We're searching through reeds, we're searching on you know, on riverbeds. Most of the time, it's like zero visibility. I was going to say you're in darkness down there. It's not so much darkness. Imagine you're diving in a chocolate milkshake. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's just dark brown water. Can't see a hand shadows, in your face. Maybe your fingertips searching. Literally, it can be painstakingly slow. Um, Kit's very, very, very heavy until you get in the water, and then you become what's known as neutrally buoyant. So that weight, you can't feel that weight. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, we just need to be rock bottom. So you see all these beautiful videos of people diving in the Red Sea in Egypt and the Med, yeah. and they're sort of floating in this crystal blue sea. That is not what I know as diving. I, I'm rock bottom yeah. in some proper dirty river, pitch black, 
three o'clock in the morning, fingertips searching for, for whatever I'm looking for. Going on from what I said about sort of diving in chocolate milkshake and zero visibility, an aid that we use is an underwater metal detector. Okay. So depending on what the job is, the task is, uh, we might be looking for something quite intricate, quite small, but it's made from metal, whether that be a piece of jewellery or what. What we would do then is use this metal detector to go back to the site where we where we located and just run this over. Like I said, it's zero visibility a lot of the time. This metal detector, obviously it doesn't go beep, 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 because that's useless under the water. So it's got lights which illuminate up here, ah, which would right. indicate a, a, a signal being picked up. Yeah. But also the handle vibrates. Like I said, visibility, I might not be able to see those LEDs lighting up but I okay. go, the handle just vibrates yeah, So what's yeah. that there? This is our sonar van then. Um, less equipment in here, but it's bigger equipment. So at the rear, we've got a boat and an engine. That is what we'd operate the sonar, up and down, up and down. And if needs be, we could also dive into that. So if we're in the middle of a lake and we get a sonar target, um, which is, you know, sort of worth diving, then the divers would get, get on board the boat, drop down and, and do a spot dive around that area to try and locate what's been identified. What have we got a marker boy? Pete, Pete's, Pete's in the boat. Yep. He's, he's driving along and he sees something come up on his laptop that he thinks is, you know, worth a diver investigating. Yep. Um, you know, the shape, the shadow, the, the, the sort of indications are correct. So what would happen is someone else on the boat would then, Pete would go, right, we're going over it now on the sonar. They would drop this in, this uncoils. Da, 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 sinks to the bottom that stays on the surface and it's a marker it's a marker right so that would be a marker for the diver to go okay cool i know it's within a five meter vicinity of that marker Clever. i'll go down and have a little look and around. there's your, that's your anchor and that's just the weight to yeah, keep yeah, that in position yeah, yeah. that's clever and we'll have three or four of these so what we try and do is triangulate a, you know, a search area so you drop one marker boy come back from maybe from a different angle in the boat drop another marker boy do it again we call it the union jack method so you go sort of cross cross diagonal diagonal yeah yeah, yeah. and that'd be our search pattern and at the same time dropping marker boys in so you can triangulate a uh, resection basically an Hello. area that would be worth searching there you are i've been looking for the rest of the crew what's been the toughest search and rescue physically and emotionally that you've ever had to do well i think they're all they're all tough. We, the, the hardest ones are drowning victims because, you know, we do deal with suicides, but the suicides people who tend to take their own life, it's, it's still sad, yeah. but it's not as bad as dealing with a 15 year old lad who's drowned unnecessarily in the river. And the thing is, it's the weather, it's, you know, in the middle of you, you might be out at three in the morning in the dark, yeah. looking, it might be pouring with rain. And I, you know, I'm sitting on the boat looking at the sonar, or a member of my team, if I'm not around, is reading the sonar device. And then you've got the divers dressing in the way and it's howling with rain. It's hard, but it's not just us. Firefighters who do a brilliant job, you know, the police, the dedicated paramedics are there on standby because if we pull a body out the river quick enough, and that's the key, that initial first response. So when you get a first response, you also get the volunteers from Lowland Rescue, are brilliant, I said yeah. Mountain Rescue, Cave Rescue up north, they're all brilliant people. But once a body goes underwater, it goes underwater. Yeah. So you can do as much surface searching as you want, you are not gonna get the body. So that hour, that nine, first 90 minute, minutes is critical. Just pre-COVID, we had five people out of a river within within the sort of 90 minutes extremely quickly again because we can locate them quickly with the sonar we recover them straight onto the river bank into the hands of the brilliant paramedics yeah. who just try to resuscitate because you've got a sort of 90 minutes it's better in cold water but that's key so it is the it's the response we have to it, the quicker we're called then the quicker someone is found yeah, yeah. if it's left for three or four days, yeah. especially in the fast flowing water, because in the winter we get the, the rising water on the rivers. So the rivers in the, in the, in the especially the Thames and places like that, it flows in the non-tidal section, Oxfordshire, it flows a lot quicker. So if there is someone on the bottom and it's really fast moving, it will get tumbled, they will get tumbled along the way. They won't be on the surface, they'll be on the bottom. The case has caused you personally the most distress and that you think will stay with you forever? I think there's so many, but I think the April Jones was a search that we did. Yeah. Um, I, along with many hundreds of police officers and you know emergency service and volunteers and the public, 
I've never seen such a big response in my life. Um, I remember going up there to McInnerliff and um, I, I actually flew up there and I, I landed next to the police helicopter and that was there. And I, I mean, walking across to try and speak to the police search advisor. Yeah. And the whole hall was crowded, the sports centre was crowded with mountain rescue, cave rescue, because they all came in. I couldn't even see him because there was too, he was too busy trying to breathe. They all was holding in like three, three every, a child. And, like, yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it was needed because it was a vast area. It was forest, it was mountains. Yeah. April Jones was a five-year-old little girl. She was adopted by Mark Bridger. And um, obviously unspeakable things happened to that little five-year-old girl. And she was put into his fire. I, I, yeah, I, I don't really want to talk about that. It was very, very sad what happened to her. She was, she, parts of fragments were found, um, <clears throat> not in the river, but in his fireplace at home. And it's, it, I don't, it's too distressing to talk about to me, and I didn't find her. So it's for, for the forensic officers who actually done that work within the house. Yeah. You know, we were just searching. We yeah. were searching the rivers, we were searching up on the, on the, in an old caravan up on the side and we got tasked with searches around you, you know using our helicopter the police helicopter and everything so it was we didn't find anything but it's when you realize what he'd done to that little girl yeah and that's where we've got to get a grip in this country of sentencing if you kill someone intentionally you go in jail for life yeah it's it's been like, a bit like the usa yeah they out there they give them a Unbelievable, 160 years. Yeah. We were on a diving job and we were recovering the body of a Polish lad out of the river and out of the port, this was in Surrey, and I was diving on this one and I, Barney had been in diving, I went in on the second dive and I'm running my hand along the search line and then I touched the unfortunate lad's shoulder and then put, I recovered the body to the shore underwater. And just as I stood up, because I was in, up to my waist, he was on the bottom. And he was still sort of lashed the ice still had a line under his arms. And as I looked to the right, there's a canal boat and there's a woman filming oh. out of the window of a canal boat. Yeah. So we have to actually put bodies in bags underwater to prevent this. So we put them in the bag, forensic in the body bag under the water. Yeah, giving them dignity. Give them dignity it? because people just want to see death and destruction. Yeah. It's horrendous. It gets it, Sadly, it gets cooked to, cooked yeah, to the they're, not dealing, it, it's they're not. not dealing with it sharp end like we and the emergency services are. They're not seeing that. They yeah. are, they're not seeing the grieving family who's that ends up on YouTube. Exactly. So it's the family who are suffering ultimately. And it's the same with the case we spoke about recently. We don't want the families to suffer. No. We just want justice and that's it. And it will justice or closure, some form of closure the family and that's all we're trying to put everybody tries to bring if you didn't have what you've got your you know the solace of the family the the the, the tranquility of the animals mm -hmm. could you do your job and come back to an empty house where you're on your own or do you do you need that support group and that sort of um therapy from what you've got does, does that really help you in your land? Well, I think everybody needs that support group. I'm fortunate to have that support group. I'm fortunate to have my mum and my loving wife and my daughter. My animals are great because that's my release route. I just yeah. enjoy living on the land and I can spend time with my animals and that's my sort of, when I say hobby really, and I take my daughter metal detector around the land. Yeah, yeah, we've got some nice footage of that. Yeah, we've got nice holidays and stuff, but I think that that's my release. So with your, with your land of work, which obviously is, is quite gruesome, dark, and you see a lot of disturbing things, do you ever get any kind of like PTSD or dreams about this kind of stuff? No, I oh, know I don't, I know I don't. I think to switch off people have you know when you think about doctors seeing this stuff all day and paramedics i i don't see it all day but i mean you, you have it's pretty grim pulling people out of rivers and things like that and you you don't enjoy it yeah but you have to switch off um, i think one of the things if i'm searching for somebody and i'm still searching i might be on a job for four or five days on, on certain jobs we've done over the years and then i will go back to the hotel at night and i will lay there just thinking where are they where are they? Where are they? things like that? Yeah, plays on your mind. I'll get the maps out and I'll start going through things on the map. So, but no, I, I don't get to suffer from PTSD. That's that, that does yeah. that, that shocks me. Like not not that no. you don't, but just that yeah. 
that you can actually just sort of switch off because I don't think I could go and well, do that line of work and see what you see. Probably mentally, I'm strong. I'm, I'm lucky I don't suffer mental health because I, I, you know, I run a big company as well, so I have to. I don't get stressed. Very seldom find me stressed out. Um, yeah, you're quite chill. Quite chill. Yeah, out. I'm very chill. But I think it's it's being able to lead the bit, lead my team from the front and on a job, and I will be doing what they're doing in the cold and wet. And I'll be leading, and that's what I think is important for any leader. Mm. Is you lead from the front. Whenever we're doing an operation which is maybe a bit high risky, and you're maybe putting a diver into a weir or something to recover a body, you're sort of on edge. Yeah. Because the you know the divers going into a really dangerous situation to right. do all the climbing, and that's why we don't subcontract our, our work and everything. You know, we the team train together. So that yeah. every person knows exactly what's in each bag. Yeah. And if suddenly one person needs to run to the truck to grab that, whether it be a medical kit or a piece of cutting equipment, they know exactly where it is on that truck. Right. They've yeah. got to ask. They're on a task today in London, but they, you know, not on another job. But I think if the team, if it say the dive team got called out this afternoon, then I will be with the dive team. What would you say that your proudest ever achievement is? Probably, you know building SGI to what it is today, because it's a big company. I love Thunderbirds, that was my favorite yeah, program. Yeah. And I grew up well, dreaming of having Thunderbird organization. You know, Thunderbirds are go. Thunderbirds are go, yeah. and that was my dream. When I walked around with you the other day, I look at all our shiny vehicles. We take pride in our uniforms, our shiny vehicles. Yeah, they're, all, they're all clean. Yeah, they're all serviced. It's certainly and an external external in there. And, and you know that if you're going to drive that truck, each switch you turn on, the, the scene lights will work. Yeah. You know, the generators will work. We, we, we test our generators weekly. Everything is checked. We've got a maritime section, so we've got four, quite a few boats as well. So we do a lot of maritime work. So you like the search and rescue FBI? Yeah, we are. Yeah. We've got a lot of kit. And people birds, are quite say. shocked when we turn up with all the equipment. Well, after a long and very interesting day, it's now time to have a glass of wine sit around the fire and get some shut eye. As a new day breaks, we have a bit of a duck problem. Over the past few days at Peaks Grounds, there's been a mus Muscovy duck yeah. egg, which has been slightly cracking, slightly making a few noises, and um, it was, it's was it been due to hatch. And this morning, luckily, as we've gotten up, it is on its way out. Sometimes you have to give them a bit of a helping hand. It's moving inside now, just trying to get out. I see, look. So you have to be very careful. There you go, look. He's, he's got his little face out, look. Here we go. Yeah, he's just trying to carefully peel back this membrane. Look, there we go. This will be another happy animal. Another, that another one, another one. Another animal that will live on Peter's grounds. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, this is something that we could never have planned to happen. It's just a really special moment. It's just trying to see. They can get quite weak, and and it's just like it's. I suppose it's a bit like a cesarean, really, where you where a lady has to have a cesarean to get yeah. get the baby out because it can get distressed. And he's trying trying to get out, but it can be a slow process, but. Yeah, you want to do it right, don't you? So you get a bit like a gungy sack in there, you see? Yeah. Keep it the wet it can live in. And they it's won't kind eat. of like the sack that, like, like a human, human would yeah, live they, in, yeah. They won't eat for about 24 hours. So they, so they can live off of, you know, them. So as we can clearly see, there's a lot more, a lot more to Peter than <laughs> standing on the side of a, a river in a, a wetsuit or a dry suit. Look at this. Is it the same process for all kind of eggs, chicken eggs, duck eggs? Yeah, well, a lot of hatch on their own, but this one's been taking its time. So it needs a bit of a help. Like you said, the C-section kind of analogy. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We just need to get, get it out. This is unbelievable. In some way. Yeah, you can tell you've definitely done this a few times before. Just have to be a bit careful. There we go. There you go, little fella. And then I can see his little eye. 
This is an absolutely documentary bonus, this, mm. for everybody. Oh, wow. It's out, look. Yeah. <laughs> well, well done, Peter, that was great. There you go. Hello. 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 Any guesses for what this is? Three, two, one. Yeah, well, this is another metal detector, deep-seeking metal detector. This will go deep into the ground for large buried boxes, items. One case we did use this on for, which was interesting, we got called in by West Mercia Police, okay. and it was, a, it was a murder inquiry to look. So the guy got stabbed, unfortunately, and it was a, a massive row of hedges, and the knife got discarded into the hedge. Yeah. Now, the police were struggling to find it, which is it's a difficult job in a hedge, trying to find a small knife and we're talking about 300 meters of hedges. Yeah. Extremely difficult. We actually use the metal detectors over the hedge. And, and we found the knife. And is it is, is that how it's supposed to be? So you've got this kind of, if you just lift yeah. it up, you've got the, you've got the sort of yeah. flat parallel to the ground. No, it's designed actually to, to literally walk along the ground at this height to actually look for deep buried targets, larger, larger targets, not smaller targets, but this was perfect for the hedge because I could literally just walk along yeah. and, we, and, and, and we found what we were looking for. It was brilliant. So again, it's having all the tools in the toolbox. You know, you can turn up at the ground radar and search the ground, but maybe the ground's not, you might not be able to use the radar. You yeah. might just need to have a keen eye. You might have a, a certain metal detector won't look for, maybe if we're looking for a buried, large buried box, this is the perfect piece of kit to do it. <laughs> All this metal detector talk has got me itching to go metal detecting myself. So me, Peter, and our two daughters, off we go. So we found we found this point, which look at it on my hand here. This is really, really old this. It's a good what is that? The girls have been metal detecting, as you as you've as you've seen, and we came across something we have no idea what this is yet. It's probably about I'd say it's like bag of bag and a bag and a half of sugar kind of weight. After giving it a good clean up, I'm still none the wiser as to what this is. Answers on a postcard please. Now let's take a look at SGI's world famous side scan sonar. This is one of the most high frequency side scan sonars in the world. This will, this will find footprints on the seabed, you know, the riverbed we're searching. This enables us to find missing people extremely quickly. We can scan, when we scan, we can scan up to 30 meters out either side of the boat to see a body. Right. Crystal clear. So you've got side scan. Yeah, it, 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 you've got, no, you've this got... is side scan. So it sends a signal out and it'll hit the target on the bottom and it, a body will look like a body. Right. So it's, yeah. it, 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 it's that clear. And and if people, we've, we've conducted searches where firefighters and so on have been walking, searching with poles, yeah. we can see their footprints on the bottom. Oh, wow. It's that good. How much would a piece of kit like this set you back? This bit of kit here was, at the time, when we bought this two years ago, the latest model, was £53,000. £53,000? £53,000. Just for Just for that and the cable and the laptop. But it, wow. it is the best. Then we've got our other ones. We've got, we got three sonars. So this is another one, which is a slightly different model. Computers built into the lid of here rather than a ruggy laptop. And this is our original. This is a bit I like. Yeah, I, brought, I was the first person to bring side scan sonar into the UK for forensic use in really? 1999. I went out to the States 
I looked at what they were doing. This is America. This is an antique now. So well, you I, kind of, sorry, you kind of innovated it in this Yeah, country. I innovated side scan. You heard that right here. Peter Falden yeah. innovated um, side scan, sorry, side scan right. scanner in, in this UK. country. For and forensic search. They were using it in America, but we, I was the first um, person in What the year UK. was that? 1999. 1999. So we've oh, done extensive trials with it, and we got down to space where we could find a you know, lady's handbag in a river with oh, wow. weapons and all sorts. So this is an antique now. Um, but this, in them days, was thirty-three thousand pounds. That's a lot. Of, so it's a lot of money. It's a lot of but money. this only, this kit enables us to bring closure to families quickly. We yeah. can search a large reservoir in a day, no problem, and find somebody where divers could might never find it. Yeah. This is really, really important underwater search equipment. This. Yeah, what is this massive torpedo here? Well, this that is, is huge. Yeah, this is a magnetometer. So this is a giant underwater me me metal detector. And the idea of this, if, if you've got a missing car um, or in a river or something, side scan someone might see it, but if you've got a massive wide area and it's buried under silt, this will go through the silt and give us a signal. So you've got right. a buried vehicle under silt or in weed, where the sonar will not see through weed or reeds. You only see it'll see down on the riverbed. Yeah. But if the stick weed, and we were looking for same metallic, we might need this. We also use a range of underwater metal detectors as well. Oh, really? Which is a really uh, another important oh, bit of what we've got. We can tow that behind the boat. Anything metallic, quite like like a shotgun, this will pick up. This technology has got specialist software. Well, this is quite basic. This is a meter readout where this has got, but that's quite heavy. That is, that is, that. I've got yeah. a lot, that's got a lot of weight to that. So this, this isn't what they call an underwater drone, you know, there's ROVs, I can show you a submarine next door, it's, there's different types of kibble we've got. Oh, there. wicked, yeah. wicked. And am I right to think that this wire will connect to here? Yes. Which will then connect to that's the correct. screen, yep. and then yep. your your workers, your lads that are on the boat, yeah, on the so you've yep. got point A, which is yep. the sonar looking for whichever missing person it may be yep into point b information goes through yep point c you can see there. The data. and the good thing about this oh, data, yeah. it's stored so it's permanently there yeah so i can then go back after a search <clears throat> and review the data yeah it gives me the location it, and, and you know it gives me everything i need to know within the hour we've normally found it, it just shows as well the importance of wearing a life jacket yeah well, well, absolutely it. that's what i'm passionate about water safety. yeah absolutely. so that you know um the life jacket, we wear a life jacket at work, we have a rule, you know, no life jacket, no job, it's a simple I like jacket. that, I like that. It's really clear that yeah. everyone wears a life jacket, there's a lot of investment here. And as me and some of the team discuss the equipment a bit more, this happened. So as you can see there, the lads got called out on a real life emergency. I don't know what happened. Pete said it's confidential and he went to the control room. This is open 24 seven as it, as it says. So any emergency calls, any calls that come in that we're, we're required on the multiple like, projects that we're involved with, yeah, it, all calls will come in here. So initially he comes through to the office, gets patched through to here. When the office go home at night, this takes calls. Right. And if a call comes in during the daytime, the switchboard, it comes patched straight through here. The team get mobilized from here as well. And the paging, our, tra our vehicles are tracked from here. Our pages are, are activated from it. So off duty, our bleepers go off and it's controlled by the operator. Oh, here. brilliant. So it is 24 seven. And is that 365 days? 365 days. Day Christmas, Christmas day, day, everything. Day, every, every, yeah. every single day of the year, this operates. Yeah, well, that makes sense know. because that, Anyone can go, any emergency can happen yeah. on it on any day of the year. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. And obviously, there's a lot of stuff we've got in here which we shut screens down on, but yeah. there's a lot, yeah. Yeah. lot of other confidential stuff we deal with. And it's, um, yeah, it's it's there. This is our control room. For example, with the April Jones search, using her as an example, when you're out actively searching, is there any conflict in your mind? when you're on the search, like part of you want to find April, for example, so that you can, you know, you, you kind of, you, there's, sla there's closure to what's happened and then the family are not going through the torch of where is she, what's going on? Or does, does part of you like 
not want to find her so that there's like still a bit of hope for the family? Or do you know that you're going out looking for a deceased body? Did was you Were you looking for April who could possibly be roaming around? Or did you know that she was already murdered? We, we, we knew really that she was already coming to meet her end. I, mean, I don't go on these jobs thinking, oh, you know, we want to find it. Or we're, unfortunately, the ones in water, it's always us who end up, when we get called, they're always on the bottom. You know, they haven't yeah. gone anywhere. But on that job, I, I I wouldn't want to have found her, to be honest with you, because I've got my own children. So I, would, I, I wouldn't want to find her. I, I want somebody to find her. Yeah, but not necessarily I yourself. I would want to find her because that would that find a little girl like that would haunt me. Yes. So I, I think I'd rather be away away from that. But we've done our job along with everybody else. Yeah. So when you're when you're out searching, you're actively you, you know you're searching for yeah. a corpse, basically. That's right. Yeah. That is that is so. I can't I can't fathom that. And again, that's. Just massive respect, you know, massive respect yeah. to the team and, and, what, and what you do because there's, there's not many people, certainly I couldn't go out uh, doing that line of work. So yeah, big, big respect. When you get the call of somebody that's, that's missing, someone that's like um, potentially fell in a river or whatever it may be, what's your immediate kind of thought? Are you thinking like they could have just wandered off? It could just be a case of someone's got lost or do you think something most cynicals happened. Well, you 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 get a briefing from the police, a thorough briefing normally. So we'll that person may be vulnerable. Um, they may be suicidal. They may have dementia. That's important to know that about the suicidal bit, isn't it? And it's dementia. All important. We we searched for a missing lady um, in Hawley who was had dementia, and her her slipper was found by the by the river. Yeah, it's like a big stream, and it was in flood at the time. And firefighters searched thoroughly, they couldn't find her, the local Lowland Rescue did. And eventually I used my own sort of knowledge of, you know, we, there was a sharp corner with a lot of debris under it. And I said, oh, she's probably under the strainer. Yeah. You know? And then we put the diver in and lo and behold, she was under there. She was there. So it's, it's again, we knew she was vulnerable. The slipper was found. She had a d advanced dementia um, and we knew that she'd potentially gone in the river. So. When we get a thorough briefing by the police, and that's important, and they'll say, this person is vulnerable, or there's a witness has seen that per. Once I get a witness, say that witness has seen her, them swimming in that river, we know we're searching for a body. The police briefing and like any knowledge from the family about the victim, yeah, like yeah. you said. So or, or other witnesses. Or, yeah. or witnesses, so you, you, knowing if they're suicidal or if they suffer from a certain mental health condition, yeah, yeah. Or if they're vulnerable, or whatever it may be, yeah. that can kind of change your search methods, yeah. maybe, and your tactics. Yeah, I mean, it depends what information you're getting. So yeah. that person, so you need to get it straight away. You've got to be could have wandered off, and if they've just wandered off, you think, well, they, 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 we're talking about more of a land search now, and that's where the police helicopters are useful because they've got thermal image cameras. And yeah, that. and also the local rescue teams because they've got lots of them. Yeah, so they they're form a big line and they go through the woods calling and listening and, and, and trying to find people. But in the river, unfortunately, whenever they are in the water, there's very, never a, a good ending. What would you say is, is worse for you? Is it fight, actually finding and, and discovering a deceased person or would, would it be harder for you to actually go and break that news to the family? Because I can, can imagine both being obviously very disturbing, but to go and break that news to a to a family member who may be still holding on to some hope is quite tough. So what would you say is, is worse or, or are they on a par? Oh, well, they're, they're both difficult, but talking to the family is always difficult. I remember a, a lad who, well, dad, the dad who drowned in the Thames fell over the back of a boat up near Shepperton Air. He, he went over the back of the boat. Son was in the river. He didn't have a life jacket on and drowned in front of his son. I had to speak to the child to tell me where daddy fell in. That must be hard. That is difficult. Um, and we took, with a police officer, went over to the river and he pointed roughly, which just gave me an easier target to find. I mean, we could have spent an hour going up and down the river in the boat, but I knew that once I got an indication, within five minutes I'll find him, which I did. But then once I got the target 
ID, Surrey Police were really good because I actually said to them, it's probably best if we let the family know because what they're going to see is lots of divers getting ready, ready by the river. Yeah. Then though we found something, so I had to go over and tell with a police officer present, the um, mum and the wife that we we found your you know husband uh, son, and uh, that was particularly difficult. And you have to go. Do you have to? I suppose that you have to kind of go into the council and all that. Yeah, you do. As well, and, don't unfortunately, you? I couldn't handle it. I had to tell them, and then. I just had tears running down my face, so I just walked, I turned, I'd done a U-turn and walked the other way. Oh, and they collapsed fun. literally in front of me. It's not easy having to deal with that. So I've been working with um, uh, Marie McCourt to look for her, you know, her daughter who disappeared over 30 years ago. She was murdered by a guy called Ian Sims. He's out, he's out, but he died. He'd done a lifetime, but he'd never, ever give up where the body was. So Marie, mm -hmm. um, brought in Helen's law, in other words, to keep a uh, keep a, a murderer in jail until he gives up where the body was. She just about got it through and then Sims was released by the parole board just as the law came in, this the recommended law. And he got released. Unbelievable, all the, sh all the work she put in and she was, he was released by the parole board. As, and he, he came out and he, he died about a year later, but unbelievable. So, Do you know what you just, this leads me on, I'm going to have to bring my iPad out for this one because it's quite a, um, it's quite loaded, but what you just, what you just mentioned about the not giving up the body, uh, yeah. not, not revealing the location, mm -hmm. it leads me on to a question which I was going to ask down the line, but it's a perfect time to bring it in. Do you believe that there's anything we, we can do as a society to make it harder for a murderer to keep the location of a body a secret? So can we say that if they don't let us know uh, where they are, that they are guaranteed no parole ever and only ever have the possibility of parole if they reveal? It's like, it's like, it, it's like Ian Brady with Keith, Keith Bennett. Yeah. Like he kept it a secret his whole life. And yeah, well, can, we, can, she, can we, can well, we forced had, it this but time? But Marie fought this and she brought Helen's law in just look at it on the internet you know yeah. she brought the law in that you shouldn't be allowed out of jail until you give up that these are called nobody murders yeah so that no one knows where they are yeah and i lecture a lot on the subject you know um, to police and it's uh, on all the cases that i've worked on yeah nobody murder conferences they call them and, and they're useful to detectives to know how things have worked you know i i think my opinion is that if you if you um, murder somebody, whether it be an adult yeah. or a child, yeah. and again referring to like uh, Ian Brady, one of the worst. Because I've got, I've got, um, I'm associated. I've got a few friends that are yeah. affiliated with the more yeah. murders. You know, I've become quite close with uh, some of the family members. And referring to like say Keith Bennett, they never gave up uh, the location of, of where he is, and now yeah. Brady and Hilly are now dead. Um, we may never find Keith Bennett, and I'm such a strong believer that if you do not reveal the location of the body, you may not get out anyway because of the how bad the crime is. Yes. But I think it should be enforced that if you don't reveal the location of the body, you ain't got a sniff of parole. Peter, can you talk us through some of this different equipment? Is this this is underwater? Well, you saw the side scan sonar. Yeah, the importance of you know, having this kit. This is an underwater camera. It's been custom made with a special pistol grip on it. So this is a light. This is a, you know, a, 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 a camera that will go extremely deep and it's on an umbilical. So what we do, if we- if So that, that, sorry, that attaches to this then? That attaches to the umbilical. If you lower it in, dive, it takes it down. Connects back to a screen. Absolutely. So we use various tools. So if you're looking for a, a murder inquiry, which is something, and you've got to retrieve evidence and you've got someone missing, body gets recovered, but then what you need to do is search that area thoroughly because the person could have lost a piece of jewellery, like an earring. You okay. won't find a piece of jewellery that big with a fingertip search. So that's where the underwater metal detector comes I'll just in. I'll bring yeah. that just down there, leave that big there. Like so that. the under, that's one of, we've got four underwater metal detectors, so that can be used. That will pick up the tiniest piece of metal 
for us to then go in. I can imagine this being more expensive than uh, on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? right? Yeah. They are more expensive. The range of metal detectors, but we've got four of them, and and, and they and they all do different jobs. So if a, if a body's retrieved from water, yep. any sort, yep. a lake, a river, the sea, yep. whatever, uh, whatever the water it may be, your kind of first uh, for your first remit would be to send this camera down to where the body was recovered well, from. Well, this, this will go down, if it's a, a, suspicious, if it's a drowning, we won't use this because we're doing a body recovery. But if right. it's a suspicious circumstances where we're not sure, or the senior resident officer from the surface maybe wants to see the body in situ, this can be taken down with a monitor on the surface in our command centre, yeah. and they can actually see what we're looking at on the ground and they can give us the instructions yeah. to then go left, go right and I'm happy now. Are you happy? So the body can be recovered gently. Yeah. Then the metal detector can then go in. And when you do recover like that, once the, if it's suspicious, i.e. for murder, something like that, yeah. then the area needs to be completely sealed off and it needs to be forensically searched for any of the tiny trace of evidence that could potentially solve the crime. Right, so yeah, this and bring some justice to absolutely. that. Absolutely, so right. you've got this, you've got the detectors, so you're not missing anything. Every piece is being unturned for the senior investigating officer. That's a really important piece, what, yeah. probably one of the most important pieces of kit in terms of water searches. Well, the, son the sonar will give us a location, so we go in with a side scan so sonar. So if we can kind of go, if we can do it in kind of stages, if you yeah. can talk us through some stages. Yeah. So there, we, we, we feel or we know that there's a body in lake, river, yeah. sea, any body of water. The first port, port of call mm. is side, side scan sonar. Side scan sonar will go in first yeah. and then we're looking for the, the well, body. Well that will show us the area. So that could, that could take an area of, let's take an area of four football pitches. Okay. How long will four football pitches take us with sonar? It would take us about half an hour to an hour. Is it all that take? That quick, that wow. quick. We got them down the boat, I can see a body 30 metres away, then we can hone in, then we can drop what they call a shot line onto the target, and I can then guide the diver precisely onto the target. Yeah. But then, if that's it, we can then take the camera down to if, we're well, not talking about a drowning here, we're talking about a, a suspicious, suspicious circumstances. We can then take the camera down to record what we've got, we yeah. can take that to the SIO to say this is what we've got on the bottom, are you happy for us to recover? We've then got a special net thing that contains evidence, so if the body is recovered it's actually wrapped, so it can't lose any potential evidence. Like all evidence will, yeah, will be it will remain within there, like you take water samples, the diatoms wow. in the water, it's very fascinating. precise. And then that area can then be thoroughly searched around that in the jack slave search, including with a metal detector, and then you know you've missed nothing. It's a very intricate yep. process, very thorough. Yep. Like you're not you're not missing anything. Um, well, it can, it can mean a conviction or not conviction, which it's is simple as which is huge. It's which huge. Which is massive. It's, it's the difference between a potential murderer walking the streets yep. or walking on his wing. Exactly. And yeah. that's that's yeah. what and that. A big part of your job is the recovery of the recovery of bodies, uh, closure for families, yep. and bringing justice to cases and bringing in closure yep. to families. Well, it's the same as big, finding you know an archaeologist looking in the grave, but without if you run a metal detector as well, then you're picking up the minutest detail. You know what you might not see because a, a piece of an earring may be inside a piece of dirt, yeah. but you're not going to break open. Yeah, it won't get sieved. I mean, dirt can get sieved, but clay is not easy to sieve yeah. because it's solid. Yeah. So a metal detector over that area will completely, you know, eliminate it. But this just shows how professional and how thorough SGI are, and this is why they are specialists. This is why they are world renowned, and they do get called out to some of the biggest cases uh, in the country, and are really successful, as you've seen in this documentary and throughout. Really professional, the lads are a top team, all the equipment's ready to go. And looking at this equipment, the money that goes into it, uh, the expertise that's needed, it's, uh, it's really eye-opening and it's really fascinating. And it's, it's great to know that this kind of stuff, this kind of equipment, is the difference between a body being recovered, somebody being convicted, 
um, on somewhere potentially walking free. So, you know, really, really good, very eye opening. What a fascinating insight that was from Peter Falding. You wonder where I get the logs for the fire. Yeah. We don't chop we don't chop trees down. We don't need to chop trees down. So this will be logged shortly as so I get my chainsaw out. And I've got myself a new electric chainsaw, which is brilliant. So it's a lot of quieter. Time. No, it's quiet though. Normally have a petrol one, we've got petrol one. But this will all be logged up and, and this will go back for burning for the winter. But so we don't have to cut trees down. There's so many trees that just drop the branches yeah. and fall. So we've always got a supply of logs. Make, making use of the uh, yeah. of dead tree. And yeah. This is obviously this is quite a fair fair sized wood. Yeah. And then we've got the other two woods. So this is this is great for I love it. I come around here in the mornings and you know in the winter you've got you know it's fantastic. You see deer, we got deer on the land as well. I can sort pig. Never turn your back on a big fat pig. What's this pig called? Buck. Buck. Buck and Sarah. And they love us. <laughs> no, they were they were they were giving to us from the RSPCA. She's got a bad leg. Watch your backside, she doesn't smell. <laughs> oh. Oi, oi, che cheeky. She's friendly. Cheeky, very friendly. <laughs> a quick drink for the crew and then back to work. Now obviously Peter Falden is very well known for searches, river searches, land searches, water searches. We've discussed a lot of that. But also what not many people may know is that Peter does a lot of charitable work, a lot of water safety lessons, a lot of demonstrations. And Peter actually spends a lot of time, a bit like Father Christmas, traveling around to different schools, around the country, comes in on his helicopter, will roll up into the schools and deliver and educate on water safety. So can you talk to us more about how this operates, how many life jackets you give, how yeah. the talks go, how often you do it? So I load the life jackets into the helicopter yeah. and I, I, I go around normally during the summer months from sort of end of May through to July. Yeah. And I, I, I deliver eight life jackets to each school, free. I don't know, charge, I donate right. them, which I now fund myself. And um, I, I pay for my own fuel and everything, and I'll do a half hour walk safety talk to the children. Oh, brilliant. And, and then I fly off, but it's the spectacle of the helicopter coming in. Can I, can Pretty, I yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. And then they're, they're not your, they're not your cheap or like No, no, these are, are the best jackets. And you, you can see as well, like you've got like reflect, like yeah. reflectors yeah. there. So yeah. also, it, so if anyone was like kind of, uh, you know, they fell into the water and they did have a life jacket on, yeah. you could, they could be found with, with light, would, would search for them and it would reflect off them. So it's also yeah. good for searching. Right? It, it, it is got a whistle as well. Just on these must be quite expensive. Right? These ones. Yeah, I pay around twenty-five pounds for them per piece. Per piece. So many people buy body um, paddle boards now, and they think, you know, they buy a paddle board, they go out in the current, and they think, oh, I'm fine, I'm strapped on the board. If you fall off and lose your board, and it's heavy weather, you know, if the weather gets choppy or there's a current, you will drown. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good a swimmer you are. Yeah. So we're just trying to promote water safety, and it's, this year I've been busy week after week after week doing averaging six schools a week. Wow. flying in and delivering life jackets. So the campaign's rolling, it's good, but there's a lot more work to be done. If you're going away on the beach, go where the lifeguards are. Yeah. Swim between the flags, that's what the lifeguards are there for. Do yeah, a wonderful yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. And if you've got a lifeguard, you, you're likely to get saved if you get dragged down in a current. Yeah. But I, I just want people to be a safety aware. Don't swim in lakes and rivers. That's where we recover all of our victims. Well, it's upsetting yeah. for you, it, a frustrating kind of thing, because yeah. it is so avoidable. Yeah, well, Stick one of these on and you can, yeah. you're, saving, you're saving your own life. You, you're you know? not going to get older kids going along the rivers wearing life jackets, but if you're taking part in water-based activities, yeah. like canoeing, and I know schools have to do them by law, but if you're, you've got a kayak, you've got a paddleboard, you've got a boat, put your children in a life jacket. Yeah. It's really, really, really important. But again, for the, the teenagers, that's m mainly who we recover. Average age, 16, 17, swimming in front of their friends, swimming out and getting caught. Their body freezes, they swim quickly, they swim ah. 100 meters, they're exhausted. It's like running 100 meters quickly. And then the cold, so it doesn't matter how hot it's yeah. outside, the cold grabs you, your muscles freeze up, you can't swim and you drown. Yeah. And that's the problem. 
it takes what 30 seconds to stick one of these life jackets on. Yep. Better to be 30 seconds late in this life than 30 seconds early in the next one. But I want the supermarkets, Tesco's, Sainsbury's have now started selling life jackets. We want to get that across the country. It should be a, it should be a it big thing. And, and yeah. water safety should be part of the national curriculum. And we're working on the water safety video at the moment. So oh. it's sort of, you know, which will be free available to people on YouTube. So it's not going to be a commercial thing. It's going to be it's going to be free to people. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, hopefully ready by next year. Even me, if I'm flying over water, I'll wear a life jacket. Yeah. How simple as that. Yeah, you've got to practice what, we, practice what you yeah, preach. We wear one at work, you know, the boys wear one, the team, we wear one every time we're through on water, we're on water a lot. So it's it, it's really important that we're just trying to drum that water safety message into to parents. You know, it's easy to be cocky and go, I don't need one, I can swim. Yeah. It's like teenagers, it's very, I was, we're all teenagers once, we know what it's like, but it's really about don't dive into weirs because weirs will tumble you around and, yeah. and drown you. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, so important. It's, it's very kind of you to do this kind of stuff. And also, like like, like you said, the theatre, the theatre of, of flying, you know, the whole, all the kids like yeah. stood there like that, waiting. Waiting for Father Christmas to pop down on his sled. Yep. So yeah, well it's very educational. I'm gonna make sure that my daughter now gets a life jacket yep. because that is something that she she lives near the coast. So well, she's gonna to need to have That's a gift from me. That's a gift from oh, me. Oh no way. So she can wear one. I, I give so many jackets away, it's really important if I can promote all the same I was I wasn't I wasn't hinting for one then. No, so I promise no, you. But promise the, you. The, you know, seriously, right. he'll save her life. And if kids just go surfing, put them in a jacket because if they get caught in a rip current, it's my daughter wears one. We go to Cornwall a lot. Perfect. If we're if we're abroad, we take one with us. If you go onto Peter's um, Facebook page, you've got a couple of videos on there of um, yeah. Well, there's the demonstrations. Lucas, there's the Lucas Dobson water safety campaign as well. It's got its own Facebook page as well. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter is the dummy falling. Into yeah. The so go and check out Peter's Facebook page, and you'll see you'll see someone doing a really professional fall back <laughs> into the water, and then she bobs like a like a cork, and you know that's what they're meant to do. Make you bob like a cork and not sink and save your life. Now we have a very special delivery for Mr. Falding. Yeah, this is uh, Luke. Uh, how are you, Luke? Nathan. Yes, yeah, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. One of my team leaders. You didn't meet the other day. No, you no. I met a few other people. I didn't meet you. No, he was on another job like a lot of them were. It was all, we're all over the place. Yeah. But, very um, busy. Yeah, very busy team. Oh, oh, great. Your life jacket on, so oh, great. Okay. Served it with the rest of them. Give it a oh, cheers, mate. Yes. So, so, so it's a, he, that's my life jacket that I wear when I'm working. It's, a, it's a, what they call a hybrid life jacket, so it's got foam in it and it blows up as well. But they have to be serviced. Oh, work. you just serve so, you yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the guys are licensed to service life jackets, so you have to be approved to do it. So uh, oh, no way. they check it and undo it. Is that more, more, of a, more of a pricey? Uh, <laughs> get it on. Get it on. Get it on. Let's get it on. There you Let's go. On through there. there go. And zip up there. Same, about the same build as Yeah, we're kind of the same, aren't we? And then they go underneath, under here, like that. A little demonstration yeah, as well demonstration, going on. Demonstration, and then that's it. They're probably a bit tight, but there you go. So you're saying um, this this is your life jacket? That's my one. Yeah. Well, well, it, it was yours. See you later, guys. <laughs> Mine now. It's good to see that Peter practices what he preaches. Always wear a life jacket. Better to be safe than sorry. Right side of this so circle. this is uh, another area that we cover which is working at height so anything on ropes um, anything that requires us to be up high whether that be a man-made structure or a natural structure like trees for example um, so obviously all our vans are loaded with lots of kit and we like to keep them really nice and tidy just for ease because we never know what we're going to come to we never know what we're going to get to when we arrive somewhere so we need to know where something is so we know exactly where to grab it from just for that sense of urgency yeah. you know looking to reduce that that time where we could be actually potentially up trying to rescue someone so with the kit itself then it's it's like i said it's working at high so as you probably expect loads and loads of ropes yeah these two bags are full of what's known as rigging kits so lots of carabiners lots of rigging plates lots of safety sort of uh, uh, equipment which is going to help us sort of do our, our working at height thing so 
With regards to working at height, that is sort of 50% of it, but a lot of the time if we're rescuing people, we might need some sort of various tools. So again, the van is very well equipped with lots of um, power tools, but also hand tools. There's sometimes we might not yeah. be able to get power sources up to some of the locations. So we have, you know, an array of um, power tools and hand tools for every eventuality, basically. Um, a stretcher as well. So again, if we're lowering a casualty down, this is a fully rated um, stretcher. So we can actually put somebody in there on lines and then lower them down safely. Which Brilliant. Is yeah. Different to the, the um, orange stretcher we saw earlier in the dive van that just sits in the water or stays on the ground. Yeah or is lifted just by you know some people, but this is actually, you could dangle someone out of sky, it's great. Thing. Proud to serve this country, because this is our country, and you know, this company is proud to serve. That's always good to see. That's on all the vans. Put the flag up there. Looking after our people, saving our people, rescuing our people. And yeah, we're proud to serve, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now it's time for me to have a quick chill out, read the paper, and go for a cheeky lie down. Luke, Luke, where is he? Luke, what's he doing? What? What? I was just, I was just um, testing, testing. Oh, we haven't got the time. I've got a job, I've got a job the, for you. The boat, Peter. I've got a job for you to do next door. You got any job? Peter's kindly invited me down to Specialist Group International to have a look around, look at all the equipment, see what goes on here. And look what he's got me doing. Washing the pots. He's got me here on the false pretenses to come and wash the pots. I knew that there was an ulterior motive. You may stand there with your brews looking all smug, but I've already got revenge planned out. So this is a remote operated vehicle, ROV. They're good for deep quarries in clear water. Right. But what we tend to use this is got a manipulator on the front that you can retrieve evidence. So we had two. Oh, is that like a little, like a little yes, rabbit claw. claw? It's a claw. So we, we were searching for two missing divers in the National Dive Centre in Chepstow, 70 metres of water. Yeah. This was the piece of equipment that found them. Because there were so many big boulders on the bottom, they were lodged between the boulders. Right. So yeah. we actually used this to search the bottom. We were called in by the police, saving the Somerset Police, and to actually search the, the, the depths with this and that's what we found them with and then we've done a joint operation with over somerset police to then do the recovery using their divers our technology our boats their boats and it was a, it was it was a really horrible job to do going yeah. forward but this is where this kit comes in handy this can also search under ships as well because the cameras move up and down you've got the powerful lights built onto the front you've also got a sonar on here which is a forward facing sonar so we can scan out in front of the oh, i just want to get a little shot of these cameras here yeah. so these, ca these cameras you say move around Peter. they do they pan they go up and down, up and down. And you can see, actually see the mechanism the right there they go yeah. up and down and this is the so this is sonar. Yeah, yeah. So this is the sort of equipment, but much bigger than would have been used to find the missing submarine. It's the Merse Oh, really? And, 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 and sonar equipment as well. Wow. So this is the recent. This, the recent. Uh, yeah, uh, this is what Titan. Ray would have used now. That was way up this depth. I mean, that is highly specialist kit. But this is this is a great piece of equipment as well. And so is it? Uh, what would it be controlled by? Is this it? is controlled on the surface by a pair of joysticks. Okay. I fly it down deep and then I can see exactly what's on the monitor. This is the sort of equipment people don't have. This is really expensive. I mean, I'm when, sure, we, I'm when, sure we this, when we bought this one, it was around 80,000. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, So a lot of money, but very useful in certain circuits where the sonar will scan a large area. Yeah. This is better for deep quarries under ships, that type of thing. Let's go and take a look inside of the incident support unit. So this is our incident support unit. It's a welfare welfare unit. So if we're diving in the winter or any other type of incident, the team are looked after. You've got the sink, you've got the cooker, which is all there. Oh, brilliant. We've got a grill, we've got a fridge under here. And then we, we go through there and we've got a changing room. So it, this is back heated. Here, back here? Yeah, this is a shower, a toilet in the back. We've got everything, food, food in the cupboards. We're ready to go. So we're totally self-sufficient. So you, you're really, really looking after your lads. Yeah, really it's really important the... because when you're diving, yeah, TV, TV. we can keep an eye on the news, what's happening. We've got a bed here that and there's a safety net which flips up. And, and you know, uh, you get a white ball for putting on the wall if we need it for, for briefings. And it's all there, so a sleeping bag all ready to go. 
So that's ready made up and it's, it's there and it's simple as that. And then, you know, and often we have families in here, so we might be talking to the family to, of, the, um, of the missing person. Right, yeah. yeah. It's like a bit yeah. of a kind of a meeting, that, meeting yeah, room as well. Can, you can block it all out, so you can block the cat, any people around trying to take pictures and you can have a private chat. Oh, really you know, you really? it. it's, it's been a really It's been, you know, I designed it myself working with a trailer company and it's been you really, clearly look you really clearly really care good. about your team you yeah, clearly look about, you clearly look after the lads and well i work with them i know what it's like to be wet and cold yeah. you know and there's nothing worse and it demoralizes you if the morale goes down if people are cold wet they've just get given a bottle of water yeah that's no good no, you want hot tea to keep you warm yeah, hot winter, food, your hands soup and or something. you're sitting yeah. here and warm up on a freezing uh, most of our work you know especially in the winter is out in the freezing cold yeah rain shine we can't say oh it's snowing it's wet we're there we've got to do what we need to do we got a shower proper shower cubicle oh wow soap ready to go um it it, it just after a dive in dirty water anytime it's hot you, you know you can go in here and, sh and shower down hot and cold running water straight out of the tank got the shower gel there other brands are available here we've actually got a toilet so we've got our own chemical toilet that's handy so again we're in there spotlessly clean yes soaps paper towels everything's ready to go and this hooks on the back of our vehicle <clears throat> and it goes on every job with us well i'll see the toilet if you don't mind just give me yeah. two minutes yeah that's fine typical absolutely typical why can't you use the toilet indoors are you done yet you've been in there 15 minutes luke Hello? Hold on, hold on. Oh, come on. I've, I've got a busy day. Remember that revenge I had planned? I wouldn't go in there if I were you. You have to sometimes, like, you have to, like, think like a murderer does. So, for example, a murderer will bury a body mm. and then they'll bury an animal above the body when you come in with your ground penetration radar and you go over and you'll see the you'll see the animal yeah. underneath the ground and you dig can you if you came across that animal can can you see through that kind of cover up straight away could you can you see through that um distraction well not necessarily so if you take the job in Boar and wood well i said i was called in by the national search advisor mark harrison at the time there was a body we believed that was, well, the neighbour said she believed the body, the body was buried in the garden, the dad, the, the father, who's 91. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> within five minutes, I found a large, straight away the ground radar found a large, looked like a coffin underground shape. I thought, well, I've been here five minutes and we found it. As Carl, Dr. Carl Harrison, as he, Carl, slowly excavated the box away, it was thinking, but this guy, he's been dismembered or he's a midget because it was quite, and sometimes you have to have a bit of gallows humour here. Yeah, yeah. And thinking, well, here we go. And and as he undone the box, it was a buried dog. Okay. But then the buried dog is there. Now that, what you don't do is just assume that it's just a buried dog. Yeah. So then the whole box, the dog gets taken out, is wrapped in plastic, the coffin gets taken out. And then it's thoroughly searched by the forensic archaeologist. Underneath. Underneath, yeah. Yeah. And then when I found the actual body up the top of the garden, buried under the path, um, with the radar, so again, um, we lifted the body out, it was still wrapped in the sheet. And then Carl then went under yeah. there to check that there wasn't a decoy. Because decoys are known. We had a, one on the Laura, Laura Torn. The Lorna or Laura torn up in um, um, Scun Scunthorpe area, yeah. in a little village, um, and I can't remember the name of the village, it's in the book. And we got there, and it was the pub landlord who had actually, he was the main suspect. And what he did, he used her stilet white stiletto shoe and left it by the river as a decoy. Ah, to right, take okay. Everybody to the river. So everyone assumed that she'd. Fallen in the river. Oh, that's very, that's very interesting. That night. Yeah, so she was there. And then we started to look around, and her body was actually found in a haystack some miles away. So we'd actually taken her body. Well, put inside it in of a haystack? Yeah, it was actually buried inside a haystack. Oh, no way. Um, and we, we had this huge task of searching. We searched the river with sonar. This was many years ago. We searched the river, and I said, she's not in that river because I can see clearly 
that she was not in that river. Yeah. And it was quite a class moving river, but it was, I said she was not in the river. And anyway, and I, I actually thought myself, you know, this is probably a decoy, this, and it was a decoy, I was right. And then eventually we all got tasked with searching a large area of haystacks. Yeah. And um, I found a, um, a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken box in a lay-by not far away. Other chicken outlets are available, yeah, by the way. And he said, that's right. And it, was a, <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a takeaway box yeah. down in the lay-by. And um, obviously you walked across the fields with her. But he was last seen in that particular restaurant yeah. on CCTV. And then it was we searched haystacks, the police. It was the police who actually found the body. So we all got tasked with a group of haystacks to actually search. Yeah. You know, sort of it, 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 it was horrendous. And again, poor girl lost her life to a, he was a pub landlord and he was having a, you know, a, a relationship with her. Yeah. He murdered. But again, the interesting bit was the decoy. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, yeah. The decoy shoe. When you're working on very high profile cases that are very like highly publicised, is more media attention a good thing or a bad thing? I don't like working in front of the TV cameras yeah. because you're distracted, you're being followed, and, and whenever you do it, you're like recently following you down the river. I've got nothing against the media because the media can keep the case alive and bring in new potential witnesses. Yeah. So there, there, there's, there's plus and minuses to everything. If there's a missing child in America, it goes out all over the all over the national network. Yeah. People get it on their mobile phones. Yeah. And it's brilliant. Yeah. And they started that. I remember when Nicola Payne, um, not Nicola Payne, um, Sarah Payne went missing. It was, oh God. It was, yeah. it was Sarah's law. One of the subjects. Sarah's law. That's all disappeared now. I mean, you know, we start these. What, things. what is Sarah's law again? I right, don't I, I'm not sure. I don't know enough. I didn't work on that, but I know Lucy was a forensic archaeologist who, who worked on it, and I think it's really about. We, we talk about this stuff. It's a bit like what I said. We, we talk about it for a while and then it suddenly dies death. Yeah. And in America, they've got, I, I visit America a lot, and they've got the, the national warning systems and the emergency radios, and they've got everything. Because obviously there's summer hurricanes and more, maybe extreme weather, but it's a really good alert system. Why can't we have that over here? So if a child gets abducted, why doesn't it go out as a text message? And it, you know, it's not a big money thing. Yeah. It's just one central system that puts that's it a, out there. That's a great idea. Because you've got, you know, you might get a suspect's car where everybody, not everybody, every it goes on Facebook, social media, it goes, it's automatically paid for by a central government or whatever. It's it's just one message, bing. And if they worked with the social media companies, it could be Instagram, it could be Facebook, Twitter, it could be across the board, it can't be that difficult. That's a fantastic idea. And it's boom, and then we've got a child missing, it's He's driving in a blue vehicle, and then all, all and it also and everyone's on the alert, and it goes over the national radio network, so all radio stations suddenly transmit that. Oh, and that, is, that is brilliant. You've dealt with a lot of like protest work over yeah. the years. Um, can you tell us more about that kind of that kind of line of work? Protest to removal work. You know, we've maintained 100% safety records since brilliant. '96, which is which is good because we train, train, train to deal with. So people glued on. You know, we 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 do a lot of big events where we unglue people or undo locks. So is that not a police job then? Uh, oh, well, the, the police do it on the public roads. Okay. But when you get something like an annual general meeting of a bank or a, or a big public event like a cricket pitch or something like that, that's not the police's job. They can't police everything. Just stop oil people like that and they'll aggravate some people. Yeah. And it's only going to be a, a short time before someone gets really badly injured. Yeah. And then the person who then is dragging, I saw someone the other day, a police are dragging a guy up the road who, who went for the protesters. Now, it doesn't in me hope that you can attack protesters, mm -hmm. but it's aggravating people. You know, I saw a lady who missed a hospital appointment, it goes on. I mean, I dealt with Swampy, I dug him out, the Honiton Bypass. He said sometimes people just want to talk to the government and no one to talk to them and things like that. But the thing is like, there certainly can be dialogue at length, but if you're a stop oil protester and you think you're clever enough to go and spray government a building, well, why should anyone talk to you? Obviously, we have certain rights and we have a lot of rights in this country, free speech and the right to protest, but, you know, there's just ways, ways we of going always dealt, When we dealt with protesters over the years, we I, I think I've been bitten once in Parliament Square. I, this guy tried to take a swipe at me once he missed. So I think really, that's it in yeah. all them years because we talk to them nicely. You've built up a really good 
um, company with Specialist Group International. You've done some really admirable, great work, some well-known work, worked on a lot of cases. Yeah. You've got a lot of closure for a lot of families, uh, very admirable, uh, a lot of respect. If this wouldn't have been your path in life, if, it, if this wouldn't have been uh, where you are now, what do you think you would have done if not this? I've got no idea. I, I mean, uh, it's, it's you were born to do, you I was born born to do it without my dad taking me down the mine, so caves and the mines and I wouldn't have been doing what I am today. Your dad is a big influence in your life. Oh, oh without it. I really appreciate you spending, mm. inviting us down to spend uh, these few days here. Mm. Like I said, we've, we've extended it slightly, so Peter's kindly let me and the team spend a couple more nights here. We've been really well looked after, hospitality's been great, watched a movie, had a nice glass mm. of wine and we've seen everything. I sat out to find out who the real Peter Falden is and I think that we now know the man behind the wetsuit or the dry suit, mm -hmm. the man away from the riverside, the man that's not just looking for missing people, there is a lot more to Peter Falden. So I just want to say thank you and I appreciate inviting us down. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tails. Tails never fails. Tails. After a brilliant and eye-opening few days, let's end this with a battle on the bays. Mark Williams, best of luck. Do you play much on this table? Yeah, we come over. Yeah. You don't say. Yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah. Who wins most? You are right. Um, Come on, let's let's have let's have a treat now. I think someone wins most of the time. She always, she always wins. No man's land here. Yeah. I'll just uh, I'll just hang by the Harley for a bit. No noise in the crowd, please. Sorry. Stop going back. Oh, nearly. I'm not stupid. I've got that blue there, I think it's not. So there you go, that was my time spent with Peter Falding, getting to know the real man, the family man, the man behind the wetsuit, the man who's not just been involved in one widely publicised case, but a multitude of cases, a multitude of skills, and a genuine down-to-earth family man. Thanks very much for tuning in, peace out.